Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning for the Winship Grand Rounds. If you are an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive a CME credit hour for attending today, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send Julie Hawkins an email or drop a note via the chat feature. This morning, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Steve Devine. Uh, Dr. Devine is currently the Chief Medical Officer at the National Marrow Donor Program, uh, Be The Match, and the Associate Scientific Director at the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research. Prior to joining the NMDP, he was the Director of the BMT Program at the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center. He served for eight years as Chair of the National Cancer Institute-funded Alliance Transplant Committee, as well as a two-year term as Chair of the NIH-funded Blood and Marrow Transplant Clinical Trials Network Steering Committee. He is currently one of the three co-PIs for the BMT CTN Data Coordinating Center. He has a major research interest in the application of stem cell transplantation for patients with acute leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome. He's authored more than 200 peer-reviewed papers and more than 400 abstracts, as well as several reviews and book chapters in the field of stem cell transplantation, leukemia, and hematology. He is an associate editor uh, for the ASTCT journal, Transplantation and Cellular Therapy, and a member of the Journal of Clinical Oncology Editorial Board. Uh, personally, it is really a pleasure to have Dr. Devine today. Uh, I worked quite a bit with him during my fellowship uh, at Ohio State, uh, and in part, it was his connection with Ned Waller that ultimately uh, helped pave the way for me to move down uh, to Emory uh, several years ago. So uh, thanks again, Dr. Devine. Thanks for getting up early uh, in uh, Minneapolis this morning, and we're looking forward to your talk. Welcome. Thank you, Jonathan. It's, uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to be uh, giving the talk today. I have uh, a lot of fond memories of uh, Emory University. My first faculty position uh, was at Emory. I hesitate to say, uh, but it was about 27 years ago. Uh, just to let you know how old I am, I was actually at Emory before Ned Waller. Uh, arrived at Emory just a little bit before. But again, uh, pleasure to, to talk to you. And I, I, I want to just uh, talk about how uh, the National Marrow Donor Program is trying to tackle barriers to transplantation, whether they be uh, HLA or non HLA barriers. So uh, let's get started. So um, these are my uh, disclosures. Again, you have to take everything I say about unrelated donor transplants with a grain of salt because I am a full-time employee of uh, NMDP, Be The Match. In this position, we do a fair amount of research, both with the NIH, other uh, foundations, as well as companies listed here, and I serve as an advisor uh, to them as, as well. So let's discuss a little bit of uh, uh, history of transplant and uh, the NMDP's uh, place in, in transplant history. As many of you know, uh, it wasn't really until the late 60s that uh, uh, transplants from related donors uh, were um, uh, successful. And that really ushered in the modern age of transplantation. It's really just a little bit over 50 years old. Uh, it wasn't until 1973 that uh, a young boy with uh, chronic granulomatous disease named Simon Bostic uh, actually underwent the first successful unrelated donor transplant in London in 1973. Uh, he was dying from CGD and they could not find a donor. So his mother worked with um, the community and actually uh, people responded to uh, an article in the Daily Register in London and 50,000 people got HLA type and they found one donor for Simon. So that's that began the era of unrelated donor transplants. And then back in 1979, this uh, little girl you see here um, in, in the slide named Laura Graves, she had acute lymphoblastic leukemia uh, and unfortunately relapsed and needed a, a, a bone marrow transplant at the time, but could not find any donors in her family. And her uh, father, um, uh, below was a rancher, but also a, a veterinarian, very sophisticated man named Robert Graves, who uh, heard about uh, John Hansen, uh, who was at Fred Hutch in Seattle, and who was interested in HLA. Dr. Hansen uh, discussed with the Graves um, the, the, the theoretical benefit of unrelated donor transplant, but that had never been done for leukemia. Uh, 
And interestingly, uh, Dr. Hansen, who studied HLA, had a file of his laboratory members. Laura had a very common HLA type, and it turned out that one of the members of Dr. Hansen's lab matched with Laura and was um, willing to be uh, a, a bone marrow donor for Laura. And that actually happened in uh, late 1979. And so Laura was the first patient uh, with leukemia to ever receive an unrelated donor transplant. So fast forward seven years um, and Dr. Graves, unfortunately, uh, his daughter, Laura, uh, relapsed and ultimately died from ALL, but he was committed to this and worked uh, with uh, the government, uh, Senator Laxalt in, the, uh, in Nevada, to actually establish the uh, National Bone Marrow Donor Registry. And that was the beginning of the NMDP um, in 1986 here in Minneapolis. We facilitated our first transplant in late 1987. In fact, it was in the winter and um, the first transplant was uh, harvested in Milwaukee and there was a snowstorm that had actually uh, shut down the airport. And uh, there was a Vietnam uh, veteran uh, fighter pilot who was willing to uh, courier and fly the um, bone marrow through a snowstorm to Seattle uh, to be able to save a patient's life. So you, you can't make this type of, uh, these types of stories up. But, now, uh, NMDP is the world's largest bone marrow donor registry. We have access to more than now 39 million adult donors worldwide. Um, and we facilitate over 105,000 transplants, um, uh, 5,000 of those, uh, uh, more than 5,000 annually. And again, our success is coupled to, to 33 years of continuous uh, federal support. So, uh, Key priorities for the NMDP are patient care. We're really here to help centers like Emory care for patients uh, and um, deliver high quality donor products uh, when you need them for your patients. We are an increasingly important source of patient financial assistance uh, as well. And again, research is also very important. Uh, we run uh, part of the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research and support the largest um, uh, federally funded network of uh, transplant clinical trials, the BMT CTN. And I just, I like to uh, take this quote from uh, an article about the history of the NMDP because I think it's important for people to understand that research has always been a major priority uh, for the National Marrow Donor Program. And were it not, for instance, for the biorepository we would not have learned all the things that we learned about the influence of uh, HLA typing on outcomes and transplantation. So just a little bit of the history. Um, the, uh, the, the research registry was actually established as the International Bone Marrow Transplant Registry back in 1972, um, within a few years of the first successful transplants and be began to receive NIH funding back in 1984. The NMDP, as I mentioned, was established in 86, and it wasn't until 2004 that the NMDP and the IBMTR got together to form the CIBMTR, and we worked together with the Medical College of Wisconsin. So the Center for International Bone Marrow Transplant Research is uh, formed from a joint affiliation agreement between the National Marrow Donor Program and the Medical College of Wisconsin with roughly 100 FTE uh, in Minneapolis and 100 F FTE at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And so um, since that time, you can see here, the number of uh, allogeneic and autologous transplants has grown. There's now over 300,000 allogeneic transplant recipients in the registry through um, 2020. In addition, we have this uh, research biorepository I had mentioned that enhances the value of the clinical data we collect uh, biospecimens not only from unrelated donor recipient pairs, but also from selected uh, older adult uh, donor and recipients and have now more than 300 million aliquots uh, stored and have now uh, distributed close to uh, 30,000 samples to investigators. Uh, again, as I had mentioned, there's 200 faculty and staff uh, and uh, over the years we've had uh, now close to 1,500 peer-reviewed publications uh, 
published on all aspects of bone marrow transplant, now increasingly also in cellular immunotherapy. So in terms of uh, uh, the trends in transplantation, just to set the stage, um, uh, a lot has been happening. Um, so unrelated donor transplants continue, in the orange there you see continue to uh, increase, although the mismatched unrelated donor transplants have been uh, decreasing mainly because of a rise in the green you see there of mismatched related transplants. Um, and uh, also interestingly, the number of matched related donor transplants has been uh, declining as well. Some of these trends are, are due to the shift uh, to older patients. You can see here from 2000 to uh, 2019, a substantial increase in the proportion of uh, allogeneic metaportic cell transplant recipients who are age 65 years or older. So most of the growth has, has actually been in this 65 to 75 year age group. While there are some patients over the age of 75 who receive a uh, stem cell transplant, it still represents only about 1% of all of the transplant recipients. But you see, again, the trends are for older patients who come with all of their comorbidities to transplantation. Luckily, uh, data from CIBMTR has demonstrated a uh, substantial increase in the uh, prospects for um, both short-term and long-term survival. This is just showing by example patients with acute myeloid leukemia. And you see how with improvements in typing and supportive care and other changes, uh, the likelihood of survival with transplantation for an adult in the United States has been increasing uh, every five years over the last 20 years. So that's the, the, the good news. And specifically for unrelated donor transplants, you see back when uh, things began with the NMDP back in 1987, the one-year overall expected survival for a patient um, under 50 with AML was about 40%, and now it's about 75% uh, percent at one year. So a substantial improvement. Much of this is due to what we've learned from the value of uh, high-resolution uh, HLA typing. And that's shown here. This is actually a study I think a seminal study that was uh, published back now about 14 years ago in the journal uh, Blood by the National Marrow Donor Program and CIBMTR demonstrating um, the uh, value of uh, matching at HLA A, B, C, and DRB1 so that uh, patients who were matched at uh, high resolution at eight of eight uh, alleles uh, have the best outcome and essentially, um, mismatched unrelated donor transplants have always been using calcineurin uh, inhibitor-based GVHD prophylaxis associated with worse survival, roughly an 8 to 10% decrease in survival for each degree of HLA mismatch. And outside the context of a clinical trial, there are very few uh, six of eight HLA-matched unrelated donor transplants uh, occurring because of uh, these data. And as I said before, also uh, less seven of eight uh, unrelated donor transplants, again, outside the context of a clinical trial. But you can see the influence of uh, widespread high resolution HLA typing uh, since the early 2000s and in the e increase in the number of unrelated donor transplants that are uh, eight of eight matched, particularly after the publication of the uh, CIBMTR paper back uh, in 2007 and its dissemination after 2008. So um, one of the issues with the requirement for HLA typing is that leads to disparity in the uh, availability of a well-matched donor based on uh, your ancestry. And so you can see here in a paper um, published by our bioinformatics group in the CIBMTR uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine back in uh, 2014, um, uh, the disparity in the likelihood of finding an HL, uh, eight of eight HLA matched donor by uh, race, as you can see uh, up to close to 80% of white European ancestry patients would be able to find uh, an eight of eight 
whereas uh, at the time of this analysis, 18 to 20 percent of Black or African American patients would be uh, likely to find um, a uh, donor in a registry. So this is all work that we do as part of our federal contract with uh, HRSA and, and the uh, uh, HHS. So just this, uh, this slide just shows you again, uh, this is updated now looking at uh, the, uh, the 39 million um, donors who have been HLA typed worldwide that the odds of finding a match uh, based on ethnic background. Uh, it's still, there's a wide gap uh, in the likelihood ranging from about 29% for Black or African American to about 79% for white uh, patients. So, you know, diversification of the donor registry is absolutely a long-term goal, but it's going to take time. So the short-term fix for this will also require uh, a change in practice uh, by the transplant centers. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this and how changing the way we prevent graft versus host disease can have an influence on the outcomes of uh, unrelated donor transplants. So when we think of um, uh, barriers to uh, transplantation, uh, there are many as listed here. And again, these barriers can affect both outcomes and access to transplantation. I'm going to focus here a little bit on um, uh, uh, access barriers and uh, donor availability. As I said, um, the National Marrow Donor Program is, uh, is laser beam focused on addressing a donor availability and the existence of a donor. I, I don't have time to go into all of the various um, campaigns and programs we have. I list a few of them here, but through uh, integrated marketing campaigns, through community outreach. And we're also expanding to high schools because um, uh, the data are very clear that uh, the best donor is a young donor, regardless of the race or ethnicity of the uh, recipient. And so, uh, there is a greater demand for young donors. So we're also addressing this by uh, expanding to, to, to high school. So that by, by the time the donor is 18, the, they would be able to uh, be on the registry uh, and, and, and donate. But uh, the task of uh, diversifying the registry uh, is uh, actually a, a, a daunting task. So this is, um, this is also data generated by our a bioinformatics group. If you can see on the left, basically what this shows uh, is the number of uh, patients who have been searching the registry and the number uh, who are what we call singletons. That's uh, a patient whose HLA type is uh, unique uh, to the tune of uh, being unique to one out of 100,000 uh, patients. And you can see um, as the patients are getting younger, the likelihood of actually being one of those singletons is increasing. And if you look at the figure on the right, you can see that uh, there are disparities in the uh, age of the patients searching on the registry by race category. In the middle, you see the Caucasian patients with the highest median um, uh, age, and then African American, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islanders also younger. So. We're getting younger and we're getting more diverse, which makes the challenge of diversifying the registry for ethnically diverse patients uh, much more difficult. So um, back uh, a couple of years ago, I uh, posed sort of a thought experiment to uh, uh, Martin Myers and the bioinformatics group. I, I said to Martin, well, what would happen if we were able to recruit every, um, uh, black uh, man in the United States between the ages of 18 to 35 and put them on the registry in one day. Now, just as a background, we are adding about 300,000 uh, donors to the registry in one day, and about 50% of them are ethnically diverse. But what if we added um, uh, 11 million? Well, the, the match rates uh, would 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 go up, um, but they would go up uh, not to 100 
100%. So they would go up um, to about 64%. You can see 63.7% if we we're able to add 11 million. And again, the 44.6% number is adding uh, 2 million. So you can see the math is working against us. So while diversifying the registry will absolutely increase the likelihood of finding a match, it won't uh, close the gap uh, completely. And we really need to do other things to try to uh, improve access to unrelated donor transplants for patients in need. So that's kind of what we depict uh, schematically um, in this slide, there are multiple ways as depicted here to be able to uh, improve um, outcomes for transplantation. And uh, NMDP and the CIBMTR have been most focused on trying to improve uh, GVHD prophylaxis and supportive care, as well as uh, understanding better the influence of graft source and donor type on uh, outcomes. And again, just to go back to some of the uh, registry uh, data, looking at trends over the last five years, uh, you can see that uh, uh, there's been significant growth in haploidentical related transplants. And this is in part because the NMDP hasn't been able to uh, address the need for uh, donors for ethnically diverse patients. So we've seen a rise in haploidentical related donor transplants and less mismatched unrelated donor transplants. <clears throat> uh, there has also been a drop in the number of match related donor uh, transplants for a variety of reasons. Remember, these are mostly older donors. So why the shift in haploidentical uh, transplantation? Well, so, um, uh, we've, uh, in this field, been able to repurpose a very old drug. Uh, every oncologist knows about cyclophosphamide. The group at Hopkins back in the early 2000s began uh, investigating um, cyclophosphamide following transplantation as a means to uh, deplete uh, activated T cells following transplantation and also as a means of improving uh, and increasing uh, the, the proportion of regulatory T cells that might mitigate the risk of both acute and chronic graft versus host disease, particularly in the HLA mismatched setting. And so if, if you look back um, uh, in the mid 2000s, less than 10% of transplant patients were receiving post-transplant cyclophosphamide, what we call PTSI. Uh, now um, it's, uh, close to 40%. Uh, in 2016, it represented uh, maybe 7% of all um, matched unrelated donor transplants were using PTSI. In 2020, it was again close to 40%. So this has been a real shift in uh, the type of supportive care we're giving in this field, and it has enabled um, an increase in the number of uh, mismatched transplants being utilized. And that's important uh, as I'll show you in the next couple of slides. So again, uh, specifically for black or African-American uh, recipients, um, there have been uh, trends to, as you can see here, an increase in the proportion of patients who are black or African-American who receive transplants. Now close to 60% of them are haploidentical transplants. There used to be a higher proportion of these recipients who, who uh, received cord blood transplants, but for a variety of reasons, cord blood uh, transplants along with mismatched transplants have been in decline. And the use of matched unrelated donor transplants has remained steady. But I will say of all the recipients of uh, eight of eight uh, matched unrelated donor transplants, only about uh, three to 4% of them are um, African-American recipients. So again, much uh, work uh, to be done. But the real question is, um, is this rise in haploidentical transplantation uh, leading to uh, better outcomes? And do we really know a lot of, uh, uh, of, about the uh, comparative outcome of an unrelated donor transplant versus a uh, mismatched related donor transplant? 
And so um, the growth of haploidentical transplantation globally has been based, I think, on a lot of retrospective data that has led to the widely held belief that recipient outcomes are roughly equivalent between haplo-related and eight of eight unrelated donor transplants. And actually, because you have an available family member and you don't have to wait for the amount of time that it might take to find a volunteer unrelated donor, that the patients can actually uh, get to, to transplant faster. So, you know, I'm just gonna go over why uh, this uh, has been a prevailing uh, view and what some of the good aspects and some of the flaws in the retrospective data may have been. And so again, when you really consider um, the influence of a donor source, you have to make sure you're isolating the uh, donor effect and you're not really analyzing both the influence of the donor source as well as the form of GVHD prophylaxis or supportive care or the, the stem cell source. So the best study is gonna be in the same transplant population using the same GVHD prophylaxis, hopefully using either bone marrow or peripheral blood, the same stem cell source and with similar follow-up time. And unfortunately, that has not been the case for the majority of what we call apples uh, to oranges comparison as opposed to apples to apples comparisons. And so this is uh, one of them. And I, I, can, I have to be careful criticizing this study because I'm actually an author on this uh, study that was published back in uh, 2015 in patients with AML, looking at a relatively small number of haploidentical transplants using PTSI versus eight of eight matched unrelated donor transplants using traditional graft-versus-host disease prophylaxis, which is typically with cyclosporin or tacrolimus. You see the wide disparity of 10 times more patients with the traditional GVHD prophylaxis. The long and short of it was um, that uh, in this uh, study, uh, we found no difference uh, in overall survival, although perhaps a lower risk of relapse in the matched unrelated uh, donor setting. So beginning uh, to, to lead people to believe that maybe there wasn't a huge difference in outcomes with uh, haplo, but again, the numbers uh, were small. So um, later, uh, the CIBMTR uh, asked the question of, well, what about um, if you have a young unrelated donor? Remember I told you that um, un younger unrelated donors are associated with a better outcome relative to older unrelated donors. And so this was comparing if you had a, a young unrelated donor versus any age uh, donor for a haploidentical uh, transplant. And then in this study, we start seeing some separation um, with improved overall survival and leukemia-free survival if you had a younger matched unrelated donor. Uh, similar treatment-related mortality, but again, that trend toward, towards lower relapse with a younger a matched unrelated donor transplant. But again, this was still an apples to oranges comparison because it wasn't using the same form of graft versus host disease prophylaxis. So it wasn't until recently that the CIBMTR uh, had enough uh, data on um, unrelated transplants using post-transplant cyclophosphamide that we were able to do this comparison. I actually didn't want this comparison to be done because I still didn't think there were enough uh, patients, as you can see, the number of haploidentical recipients of PTSI over the years was quite high, whereas the number in the reduced intensity, the so-called RIC group, was only 187. And then the, the number in the um, myeloablative conditioning group was only 97. So uh, I was concerned that we really wouldn't be able to show differences because the study was, was underpowered. But, uh, uh, and again, you can see the unrelated donor recipients were older. As I said before, they're less diverse. Although what's interesting is that while everyone um, thinks that the haploidentical patients get to transplant uh, earlier, there's actually no evidence that that actually is, is the case, um, at least in the published literature. So I think that remains to be uh, seen. Again, the same was true in the recipients of myeloablative 
conditioning or so-called MAC uh, conditioning. So the primary uh, um, uh, outcome was uh, overall uh, survival. And as you can see here, um, the, the, the differences were most marked in the recipients of the reduced intensity conditioning uh, cohort. The haploidentical recipients had worse survival due to a higher risk of graft failure, slower engraftment, more severe acute graft versus host disease, and a higher um, non-relapse mortality. So this first apples to apples comparison of patients mainly with um, myeloid diseases, although ALL patients were included, suggested that at least the older patients who receive reduced intensity uh, conditioning benefit more from a matched unrelated donor transplant uh, than a haplotransplant. The differences uh, in overall survival were not as marked in the myeloablative conditioning of patients, although haploidentical transplant was associated with higher severe acute GVHD and slower uh, platelet engraftment, although follow-up was only one year um, in this trial compared to RIC, so differences may emerge over time. And I'm showing you here uh, unpublished uh, data um, that was also performed by the CIBMTR. This is a uh, study that was uh, submitted to the American Society of Hematology 2021 meeting in lymphoma patients. And this is a similar comparison of eight of eight matched unrelated donor transplants to haplo with PTSI uh, over the last decade. And it basically showed the same thing as we saw in the previous study by group two, that virtually all of the clinical outcomes except for relapse uh, favored the, the MUD. Overall survival, progression-free survival, non-relapse mortality were all better in the recipients of matched unrelated donor transplants. And you can see the forest plots in the figure of the right favoring the matched unrelated donor transplants. And so when we actually look at every transplant reported to us, so remember, because of our contract, we receive um, uh, outcomes data on virtually 100% of all of the allogeneic transplant recipients in the United uh, States. When we look at outcomes uh, in the multivariable analysis and break it down by uh, donor type, and we use uh, matched sibling transplants as the reference, we do see that outcomes using mismatched donor products are worse than using matched donors. And that includes mismatched unrelated donors, cord blood, and haploidentical uh, recipients. So I think um, the, the prevailing uh, uh, thought that haploidentical related uh, was equivalent to eight of eight unrelated donors is increasingly, uh, at least in the adult setting, uh, not uh, looking like it's uh, the case. And some of these studies uh, have led to editorials in, um, or review articles in journals like the uh, Journal of Clinical Oncology and Blood that's, that confirm that uh, HLA matching does in fact uh, still um, matter. And that the, the burden then is on organizations like the National Marrow Donor Program to actually be able to identify in a timely manner uh, a, a, a suitable matched unrelated donor and to get that donor to you in the time that you want for your patient. And so I think uh, 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 eight of eight is likely better. Again, I have a, a bias in this direction, but again, only better if we were able to um, actually procure cells from those donors and get them to you for your patients uh, on time. So we think that this leads to a new paradigm that uh, eight of eight uh, unrelated donors using uh, post-transplant cyclophosphamide is likely better than haploidentical related, which may be equivalent to mismatched unrelated donor transplant. And I'll tell you in just a second why I think that may be uh, the case, or at least that's a, a uh, a question that could be answered in a clinical trial. So um, again, mismatch graphs, uh, we think are going to be an increasingly uh, important uh, unrelated donor source, particularly for racially and ethnically uh, diverse uh, patients. Um, and why is that? Well, again, 
This figure uh, on the right um, is uh, based on modeling uh, that's been done by our bioinformatics group. Uh, if you look at the first column, AFA, the African Americans, you see about 22% availability of an H eight of eight match. But if you look at the orange, the orange represents if you could do a seven of eight transplant and green represents a six of eight. So what this shows you is um, uh, the ability to uh, perform seven of eight transplants successfully would increase donor availability up to 72%. And a six to seven of eight would increase donor availability all the way up to 97%. So that really would allow us, if we could do this successfully, uh, to close the uh, disparity gap and access to a suitable donor uh, while we're waiting to uh, increase the diversity of the registry. So we think this is something that we can do now to improve uh, outcomes. And so uh, this knowledge actually led us back in 2015 to develop uh, a protocol actually evaluating the use of post-transplant cyclophosphamide with sirolimus and mycophenolate mofetil in the uh, uh, matched a mismatched unrelated donor setting. And so this study, which the results were published uh, earlier this year in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, we think uh, really gives us a glimpse into the future of mismatched unrelated donor uh, transplants. Um, so um, what was interesting is that 48% of the 80 patients who were enrolled in the study were racial or ethnic minorities. And you know, um, if you do cancer clinical trials, that's a very high proportion of uh, minority patients to be enrolled uh, on a, a clinical trial. Um, and what was interesting also is that uh, overall su survival did not differ by HLA matched. We allowed anywhere from a four to seven of eight um, a donor to be uh, uh, used for this trial. And actually 39% of the donors were less than seven of eight matched with the recipients. The recipients could have received either uh, reduced intensity or myeloablative uh, conditioning. We actually then went on to compare outcomes uh, in both the myeloablative and the reduced intensity conditioning in patients um, who were transplanted on this uh, trial to haploidentical recipients of either bone marrow or peripheral blood um, from the registry. You could argue whether this is a fair comparison or not, but our data suggests uh, roughly equivalent uh, outcomes, at least in terms of overall survival, uh, comparing mismatched unrelated donor transplant, whether it be with bone marrow or peripheral blood. I will make note that um, all 80 of the uh, recipients on the, this trial uh, reported here received unrelated donor bone marrow because at the time bone marrow uh, was being used more commonly in the mismatch setting. But that does pose a problem for us. As you can imagine during the pandemic, it's been very difficult to procure uh, bone marrow because of uh, the availability of OR space and the testing and the likelihood that patients may, uh, that donors may test positive for COVID. 19. So we would really also be very interested in seeing if these outcomes could be replicated in the peripheral blood uh, setting. And so um, when our study was published in Journal of Clinical Oncology, there was also an accompanying editorial uh, that suggested that the results of uh, the NMDP study will definitely rejuvenate research efforts in the use of mismatched unrelated donor donors worldwide, because as I've explained to you, it would really help us tackle this issue of how do we improve access to transplantation for racially and ethnically diverse patients. And so uh, I just wanted to call your attention also, we, the, the NMDP is not the only group to show um, good outcomes using post-transplant cyclophosphamide in the mismatched unrelated donor setting. <coughs> this is a single center study here from the city of Hope that uh, was published recently in Blood Advances, also showing uh, excellent 
one year overall survival of about 87% in recipients of seven of eight mismatched unrelated donor. And this were all recipients of peripheral blood grafts, whether they have received reduced intensity or myeloablative conditioning. So these uh, outcomes uh, have led us to um, sponsor a, a study that's actually recently been activated through our network. And I know uh, Emory will be um, opening the study. And actually, uh, Muna Kayed from the uh, pediatric group at Emory is one of the study chairs for the pediatric stratum. We are running a large uh, multi-center phase two trial of HLA mismatched unrelated donor transplants using this time mobilized peripheral blood as opposed to bone marrow from the prior study, looking at one year overall survival. And um, we're gonna have three strata. So two strata as we did in the prior study, one with re adult recipients of myeloablative conditioning, the second with reduced intensity. And we break those out because there really are different types of patients to receive the two types of transplant conditioning. And the, the prior study did not include pediatric patients. So we're also going to be opening uh, a pediatric and young adult stratum uh, using bone marrow as the graft source in this group. Uh, and um, this will actually be an exploratory stratum. The, the study is powered uh, on the, the first two. We plan to have 70 patients accrued to both stratum one and stratum two for a total of 140 uh, adult recipients. This is going to be activated at 36 uh, US transplant um, uh, sites uh, throughout the network and hopefully will accrue uh, within 18 to 24 months, possibly even sooner. And we're going to be able to see if this is really um, uh, uh, a good option uh, particularly for racially and ethnically diverse patients. So I, I would be remiss if I did not uh, uh, mention um, uh, the use of other approaches to improve mismatch unrelated donor transplants, uh, particularly since Emory University has been squarely at the forefront of this. And so I call attention to uh, a phase two uh, trial. You see Ben Watkins, first author, Leslie Keene, last author of uh, uh, another approach using co-stimulatory blockade for the BATICEP to prevent acute graft versus host disease. There were two strata, an HLA matched unrelated donor stratum, but also a mismatched stratum, which we compared to a pre-specified matched cohort from the CIBMTR. And you can see here uh, in the figure um, in the middle here that the outcomes for patients on the uh, ABBA trial were substantially uh, better than uh, CIBMTR recipients of standard calcineurin-based uh, GVHD uh, prophylaxis, suggesting that this approach may in fact be uh, lead to improvements in outcomes uh, for recipients of mismatched unrelated donor transplants. And again, this is just more data from the study suggesting that outcomes are particularly relapse-free uh, survival, and particularly in the seven of eight cohort, were approved compared to registry controls um, uh, using uh, abatacept. Again, this was not uh, uh, randomized data, but we think uh, very uh, tantalizing. The data have been uh, taken to the FDA um, by Bristol-Myers Squibb, um, and so uh, FDA has accepted and granted priority review uh, to a supplemental BLA for abatacept to prevent moderate to severe acute graft versus host disease. And I think importantly in patients who are age six uh, or above. And so we anxiously await this decision by uh, the FDA, which we again will think will um, really increase transplant options for our patients. And so um, in the remaining uh, just a few minutes I have, I want to talk about how uh, uh, NMDP and CIBMTR have been tackling some of the non-HLA barriers to transplant because they are many and they are difficult and, and challenging. And uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, in, this, in this arena. And so um, the, the 
NMDP uh, published recently uh, a study uh, looking at the likelihood of a patient who has uh, an initial search actually going on to receiving a transplant. And, and the bottom line, as you can see here in the, in the bold, is that uh, if you aggregate all the patients, white patients, uh, not surprisingly, were far more likely to uh, receive a trans, uh, transplant uh, versus a black or African-American transplant, even after having uh, a search uh, initiated. Uh, poverty is also another uh, barrier uh, to transplantation. This is a, a CIBMTR study uh, looking at uh, uh, patients from areas with higher uh, poverty rates with acute leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome that demonstrate that um, the, those uh, types of patients are less likely than patients from wealthier counties to undergo an unrelated donor uh, transplant. Um, and this is true not only for adult patients, but also um, for pediatric uh, recipients uh, as well. And so looking at uh, na neighborhood poverty exposure defined by high poverty zip code, um, we, we noticed that the ability to get to transplant uh, as well as uh, outcomes following transplant Transplant-related mortality were higher from uh, uh, patients from uh, uh, areas uh, of poverty. Uh, and if you look also at outcomes based on the type of insurers, we found that uh, recipients who had Medicaid uh, had worse outcomes compared to those with um, private insurance. That theme is uh, also uh, carried on uh, in the specific subsets of patients. Uh, this is a study um, between our health services research group, investigators uh, at uh, Emory University, you see Stacy Arnold, Krish uh, on this uh, paper that uh, demonstrated that uh, access to transplantation and outcomes uh, were worse depending on whether patients had private insurance versus Medicaid uh, insurance. So um, a lot of work that still needs to, to, to be done in this very challenging uh, and difficult non-HLA uh, barrier to uh, transplantation. So um, we take uh, the issue very seriously here. And um, I'm proud to say one of the uh, areas that the NMDP has been able to bolster over the last several years is the ability to offer uh, your programs and your patients uh, financial uh, assistance. Um, and patients are, are, are eligible for financial assistance where they're prior, you know, being seen uh, prior to transplant as a formal search is ongoing or after transplant, uh, if they've had a, a, a transplant uh, facilitate either from a unrelated donor or related donor. I failed to mention that we also facilitate related donor transplants from donors who can't travel to the transplant center. In the last year, we facilitated uh, over 360 related donor uh, transplants. So this, is, this assistance is based on um, need and we can provide uh, a, 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 both financial assistance direct to the patient as well as reimbursement to the transplants for search uh, assistance, both for unrelated donors, but also for first degree uh, relatives. Not surprisingly, um, this is just a monthly report, but it reflects the um, increasing use of this program uh, in fiscal year 21. As you can imagine, since the pandemic, uh, the financial needs and the re uh, request for uh, financial assistance have gone up. And luckily, we've been able to meet the need and have provided um, over five and a half million dollars in financial assistance to patients in transplant centers uh, in fiscal year um, uh, 21. I, you know, we can't probably provide enough, but we hope to be able to actually increase this by another two million dollars in FY uh, 22. 
So um, to conclude, uh, I do think the National Marrow Donor Program has a significant role to play in addressing disparities in that both access to and outcomes following hematopoietic cell transplantation. And I hope I've demonstrated that we are actively engaged uh, in both patient and donor-centered approaches to improve access to transplantations. We are currently leading several observational and interventional approaches to understand and overcome disparities in access to a potentially life-saving therapy. And again, we view our role as a partner with centers like Emory and other transplant centers and stakeholders to collectively uh, get at access barriers and improve outcomes. And ultimately, we exist to help you take better care of your patients and, and make doing that easier. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge again that this is really all about the patients and their families. I don't have to tell you that, uh, but want to thank all of you who have worked, particularly during the pandemic at our network transplant centers. Uh, and you're doing an amazing job. I'd like to thank all of our network partners, um, our incredible volunteer couriers who have taken the risk uh, to travel with donor products, uh, our federal government support from the Navy, HRSA, NIH, the legislators who keep appropriating the funds, and finally, to the donors uh, who really uh, make this happen and make incredible sacrifices uh, in order to save our patients' lives. So thank you very much for your attention. Great, thanks so much, uh, Steve. Uh, as usual, a uh, uh, very interesting and inspiring talk. Um, uh, if uh, any of our uh, audience members have any questions, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of the screen, um, and we'll uh, do our best to get to as many questions as possible in our remaining time. Uh, while we're waiting on some questions, I just want to mention that next week there will be no grand rounds, uh, and we will return on Wednesday, October 13th to hear from Dr. Manali Bave from our own uh, medical oncology division, who will be presenting the evolving uh, landscape for the management of triple negative uh, breast cancer. Uh, and as a reminder to view all upcoming Winship Grand Rounds lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center website uh, or the Winship calendar. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, the uh, first uh, question is from Dr. Waller, uh, who says, great talk. Um, has there been any analysis of the T cell repertoire and transplant recipients of four out of eight haplotransplants versus seven out of eight or eight out of eight unrelated donor graphs following post-transplant cyclophosphamide. One might expect better immune reconstitution in the former group due to less deletion of T cells due to the lower precursor frequency of alloreactive T cells. Yeah, and uh, as usual, a great question by <laughs> Ned, and as usual, I don't have uh, an answer. This is something that, uh, you know, we, we, we ultimately want to do a, a comparative trial. We think if the uh, access trial um, in the four to seven of eight using purple blood uh, shows a similar benefit to the bone marrow uh, trial. We uh, at NMDP would be very interested in actually sponsoring a comparative trial comparing haplo related to mismatched unrelated donor transplants where we could do some of this work. We are planning to do some of this work. It's very expensive net, as you know, and so um, I, I don't have a, a great answer for you, but I think it's a it's an important question, particularly as we think about all the potential infectious complications uh, that could arise, as well as the risk of relapse uh, post transplant. Uh, Dr. Kaufman had a question, uh, so he uh, is interested in, in considering some novel stem cell collection methods for donors. Uh, so, for example, using fluorexaphore or or something similar. Um, is there a role for uh, novel methods to make it easier for donors or, and, and or possibly result in a better product? Yes, it's, uh, I kind of, it's almost as if I uh, planted that question because right. we actually have a uh, ongoing um, study right now. Uh, actually, Emory is uh, participating or about to activate the study looking at, uh, you know, as you know, using uh, filgrastum it takes five to six days to adequately mobilize stem cells from our volunteer donors. And it is associated with moderate uh, and sometimes even severe pain in a substantial fraction of the donors. So 
we are actually uh, evaluating a one-day mobilization where we give uh, Plerixifor, which is a CXCR4 antagonist, which mobilizes just in a few hours together with a um, product that's being developed by a company called Magenta. It's a grow beta uh, agonist, which has been around a long time. So it's a GCSF3 combination that uh, is being studied actually in multiple myeloma at Stanford, but we have a both a related and unrelated donor study ongoing. Um, and we've just begun this, we've treated uh, four donors with this um, uh, and the results are, are, are promising and it seems to be safe. So more to come on, on this. And again, hopefully Emory will be accruing to the study as well. Um, one question that I had, and we talked a little bit about this sort of before the session this morning, um, is, is a little bit off topic, but um, you know, it, within our own transplant group, we've been sort of figuring out how best to handle COVID-19 vaccination um, with both our patients um, as well as caregivers and, and, and so forth. And so I was just curious in, in your work, you know, nationally, you know, how have other centers been, been handling this um, as far as re recommending and or requiring vaccination for patients, you know, completing stem cell transplantation and their caregivers? Well, it's, a, it's, it's an important question um, that we are trying to address in a couple of ways. I, I think the feedback we're getting from the transplant centers, they're trying to vaccinate um, their patients both prior to transplant. And then the issue is post-transplant. I think the issue of boosters and how, how you should revaccinate patients after transplant because they might lose immunity uh, is an open question. We actually are funding a study through the blood and marrow transplant clinical trials network to look at response, both B cell antibody responses as well as T cell response to uh, both mRNA and adenoviral vaccines, both in um, autologous allogeneic and even in cellular immunotherapy recipients. And so we're, we, we have uh, approved now about 180 patients to an ongoing uh, trial, but we certainly encouraging, we're, we're hearing that most of the transplant centers are actually requiring um, their uh, healthcare workers who have direct contract with, contact with patients to be vaccinated as, as well. We're also asking that all of our donors uh, uh, try to be vaccinated and we're, we're, we're trying to collect the data and know exactly who is vaccinated and also to collect blood on those to look at uh, uh, seropositivity in the donors. We don't have any data yet. Sure. All right. Looks like we are just about at time. Um, and so uh, we'll go ahead and, and, and finish up and uh, let you get some rest. I know it was an early morning. Um, I just want to uh, quickly uh, thank Dr. Arjano for pointing out that um, uh, we do have the uh, Winship uh, 5K uh, this, uh, this weekend. So uh, please, if you have an opportunity, uh, be sure to um, be sure to participate. I know we're all looking forward to it. Um, but otherwise, uh, thanks again, Dr. Devine, for, uh, again, as usual, an excellent talk and uh, looking forward to one day getting you down here so that we can uh, visit in person. That would be great. Thank you very thanks much. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Take care.